Hello, everyone. My name is Alicia, Alicia Modena. I am Deputy Director and Professional Development Coordinator at Euroclio. And I'm very, very glad to welcome you all here to the um, last session of our webinar series on using Historiana to teach history from different angles. Uh, we, have, we started with looking at coffee and teaching about globalization and the global movement of goods. So we started from a very, very wide angle. And then we narrowed it down quite significantly, looking at Bologna and the rise of medieval university and paintings of everyday life as ways to teach about local history and how this fits into the broader picture. We're going broad again. And today we're looking into railways and connectivity. And I'm very, very happy to welcome Bridget Martin here with us to talk about that. Bridget is also a member of the History and Teaching the Learning team. And yeah, and she has she will be hosting this webinar. So Bridget, the floor is yours. Just take Thank it away. You. I might just briefly introduce myself before I share my screen and get started on the presentation. So yes, I'm Bridget Martin and I am a member of Euroclear's teaching and learning team for Historiana, and I'm also a classroom teacher at the International School of Paris. So I'm teaching as part of the IB curriculum. So since there's so few of us, I will say, please, I, you know, it would be wonderful for this to be quite a relaxed session. And so if you do have comments or questions or anything that pops up as we are going through, please feel free to either put that in the chat or I'm going to say even unmute yourself and, and make a comment since that there are not too many of us and I think that would be lovely if you feel so inclined. So we will be talking about railways and connectivity today and I also just want to start by thanking you all for being here. I know it's the middle of the week and we're getting right to the end of the school year and everyone's a little bit worn out so I think the fact that you are here is a wonderful thing and I really appreciate it and I hope it might be useful in terms of giving you just a few ideas of things you might be able to use in your classroom. So in terms of what I'm hoping to cover in the next, I think around 45 minutes we're looking at, I'd like to introduce you first to the source collection about railways and connectivity. I'd then like to spend a little bit of time talking about theory and historical thinking and particularly focusing in on the idea of evaluating historical significance and considering different approaches we might take to evaluating historical significance in the classroom and then pulling those two things together with a few learning activity ideas to sum up the session today. So that's where we are heading. So let's start with a little bit of an introduction to the source collection. You can find it here in the historical content section of Historiana. This source collection is one that we developed in connection with Europeana. So in case you haven't already heard of them, Europeana is an online repository for millions of sources that have been uploaded from different cultural institutions all around the continent. So if ever you need to find a source, it might be a good place to look. And what we have tried to do with Historiana is collate certain sources and, and put them together in a collection that makes sense. And in this case, the focus was on railways and connectivity. So you can see from the description here, the focus period spans from the 17th century all the way up to the 20th century. And also the source collection tries to look at different types of rail connections. So passenger railways, luxury rail travel, rail used in times of war and in the aftermath of war. So we're seeing lots of different uses and practicalities in terms of the railways that are included in the collection. And then you can see in terms of the different questions that have been posed here by the sources created. It's the collections creator, sorry, who was Grace Sohota. A lot of these questions are about connections and transnational connections particularly, and also interconnectedness. And we'll look, of course, at a few of those sources, but you can already see by those little previews at the top there, we've got a mix of photographs and maps and different sort of images and artistic pieces as well. So in terms of the way the source collection works, it takes a transnational and a global view of railways and connectivity. So it's not only looking at railways within Europe, of course those are included, but there are several other railways from different parts of the world that are included. For example, there's a source there relating to the Thai Burma Railway, a source relating to the Japanese bullet train, there's a source about the partition of India and Pakistan. So this source collection really does attempt to be as global as possible in terms of the examples of different railways it's taken over time. And it does take a broadly chronological approach. 
So this means we can, in terms of that zooming out that Alicia spoke about earlier, it means that we can zoom out in different senses. So geographically speaking, but also chronologically speaking. So we can look at evolution and different developments that took place over time. I think the key thing that's interesting about this collection is the way that it allows for comparison. And I think depending on the sources you select, you can compare various different aspects of these rail connections. So it could be a focus on the actual technology and how that has evolved over time. So you can see, for example, in the slide here, I've put the source that is showing us the very first passenger rail service, which was the Mumbles Railway, and we can see it's horse-drawn. And this might be an interesting starting point to then compare to steam engines and, and all the way up to the bullet train, which I mentioned earlier. So we can look at this, we can also compare construction and development of these railways. So a lot of the descriptions of the sources do give us some insight into who were the people that were rec recruited to build the railway, how long the construction took and these kinds of things. I think it also allows comparison for different uses. So we can see in the other source down the bottom here, for example, the hospital train that was used in times of war. And so we can look at the different functions that railways have served in different contexts and places over time. And we can compare the impacts. And that I suppose is what I particularly wanna focus on today, although we'll also touch on the others. But if we're considering how significant these different railways might've been or the development of these connections in general has been, I think impacts is something we can also compare and contrast in these different examples. Now it is designed and we always try for a historian to design complete collections that are a cohesive unit, but there are also just some excellent individual sources. So it might be that depending on what you're teaching, you just choose a couple of sources that relate specifically to World War One that are in there, or you might like to try and use the source collection as a whole. So even though we are suggesting this could be a way to kind of zoom out and take a global view, there's also absolutely scope within here to zoom in to specific case studies and, and different railways over time. So in terms of how you might use this in your classroom, how you might be able to integrate this to your teaching, I can see two main sort of routes one might take. So the first is a, a using these in thematic units. Now, I don't really know what your teaching contexts are, but within the IB, the International Baccalaureate, particularly in the younger years, the focus is really conceptual and so we do look at big broad concepts and themes like revolutions or globalization and if you have a curriculum that allows you to do this I think this is where that zooming out approach could be really valuable with this source collection so you could look particularly at railways as an example of technology evolving or globalization and connection and these kinds of things but I do also think that if you have a curriculum that's a little bit more focused on particular periods or events in history, there are some really great sources in here for those units that I've mentioned there, particularly the First and the Second World War. And there are some really interesting sources. For example, this one here that was created by a Dutch, I believe is a prisoner of war that created a whole set of artworks commenting the experience. And in this particular one, we can see the development of the Thai Burma Railway. So there's some really interesting sources that relate particularly to different events and periods in history that might also be usable for you, depending, of course, on, on what you're teaching. So these are just to give you a bit of an idea of the collection itself and ways that you might be able to use it. And now I'd like to turn to the more theoretical part of the webinar and look particularly at historical significance. So what we do try and do with these series in general is focus in on particular historical thinking concepts or, or other aspects of historical thinking to see how we can really apply this theory into practice. And so I've chosen today to look at historical significance. I think it would be worth starting by considering what we mean by historical significance. And of course, I'm sure you've already encountered many different possible definitions. One that I find particularly useful is this conceptualization that comes from Christine Council in a paper that she wrote in 2004. And she differentiates essentially three different levels at which we might consider or talk about historical significance. So the first level is the significance of history, by which she means why is history significant 
as a subject for us to learn about? And are we able to justify the teaching of history and its place in the curriculum, for example? Why is history worthy of study? I think for our purposes today, this one is probably the least relevant, but in terms of going through the conceptualization, I thought it was worth mentioning. She then talks about significance in history. And here, what she's referring to more is, how do we decide which topics, which events, which periods, which individuals we will study, we will write books about, we will include in school curricula and so on. And so this I think is perhaps more relevant to railways, for example, why would we include railways? Should we include them? Are they indeed significant enough to merit our attention and study? And so I think this is definitely an element that we could absolutely consider, even though, of course, students don't necessarily get a say in what's included in their curriculum. But these are, I think, important questions for us to think about. And then the third level, and perhaps kind of the, the most zoomed in level, is significance in the context of historical accounts. And this is probably the one that we would use most frequently in our classrooms. And by this, she's meaning the significance of sources, for example, of different interpretations, of factors, if we're looking at causes or consequences, we could be weighing up the significance of different causes, different consequences, and so on, or indeed different individuals. And I think that third level, therefore, is probably the one that's most relevant today, although, as I mentioned, I think that second one might be relevant to us as well. So, of course, we could be talking about a whole range of things when we mean significance, but I think in particular with our, with our students in the classroom, we're talking about particularly those latter two. So for instance, we might be asking questions like, how could we decide how significant or not the railways and trains that are represented in the sources actually were? And are they actually worth us learning about? And of course, I think there's an element of perspective that's gonna come into this discussion as well and, and how different groups might feel differently about the significance of these connections. But I do think what I've put at the top here is probably the key and most important question is how can we actually measure that? If we're gonna have discussions with our students about historical significance, how are we to decide what is or is not significant? So I'd like to share with you, and I apologize if you've seen these already, but I think it is useful to see what is out there already in terms of the literature, some existing approaches to assessing historical significance or evaluating historical significance. So the first one, and perhaps the most familiar if you have done some research on this in the past, sorry, excuse me, <coughs> comes from Jeffrey Partington and it was written in, created in 1980, but it is still quite present in the literature as I was preparing for today, I was having a read and it, it's still very present. And Partington suggests these five interrelated criteria for deciding on historical significance. So first of all, he says importance could be one way we measure significance. And by that, he means importance to the people in the past. So if we're looking at a particular period, are we able to see presumably from the source material that this was considered important by the people in the past? Then I think these next two are quite interesting because they perhaps contrast with each other. So profundity is about how deeply people's lives have been affected by the event or the period or the innovation or whatever it might be. And then quantity is about, well, how many lives have been affected. And I think this can be a really rich and interesting place for students to have discussions. So I'm gonna go a little bit off the topic of railways for a moment, but just an anecdote from my classroom last week, we were looking at the Malayan emergency and the British response to the communists in Malaya in the 1950s. And we were trying to, or the students were trying to weigh up the significance of different responses. And there was one strategy used where the population was all given ID cards in an attempt to keep track of people. And then there was another one in which hundreds of thousands of people were forcibly resettled as a part of the defenses against communism. And so there was quite an interesting discussion amongst the students about, well, on one hand, the whole population was affected by the ID card and registration process, but carrying around an ID card for most people didn't necessarily affect their lives particularly deeply. Whereas in contrast, those people, even though it was a smaller number who were uprooted from their homes and forced to live in, in new places that were very deeply affected. And so these are sort of ways that they were trying to 
compare and contrast or, and decide on significance of different strategies. But coming back to what we're talking about, other things that Partington mentions is durability. So how long did this effect last in terms of people's lives and also relevance? And, and this is, I think, what's interesting and comes up in a lot of these approaches is how does this event or period connect the past to the present? And is it particularly important for us understanding present life? So that's Partington's approach. Another approach that comes a bit later, or significantly later, I suppose, comes from Robert Phillips, and he explicitly was drawing on Partington's approach as he developed these ideas, and these were specifically for studying World War I, and I think we need to bear that in mind when we look at this. I think what's interesting and what makes this maybe usable in the classroom is that he's used a mnemonic device, so he's spelt out the word great, and each of those indicates a different aspect of significance. So was World War I significant because it was groundbreaking, because the events were far reaching and so on. And of course he chose that word in particular because the core question that he was working towards was why, do, why was this war referred to as the Great War? And could we find evidence to support significance in each of these different ways? So this is another sort of approach that you might want to use with students, particularly if you are studying World War I. I think something that's also quite interesting about Philip's approach is that he, in addition to this great mnemonic device, suggests that we might also divide significance up into different categories. So we might look at an event or a period and consider its economic significance and compare that to its social significance or its military significance and find evidence to support significance in each of these different aspects or categories. And I think that might also be a useful way for us to conceive of significance and find ways to attempt to measure and, and justify claims about significance. Okay, so Christine Council, who we heard from earlier, it was her definition and conceptualization that I presented a little bit a little bit earlier, also used a mnemonic device. She again was building on what Phillips had done. She just felt that his work was very centered on the First World War, and perhaps it would be useful to find something that was more generalizable and could be applied to lots of other different historical periods, events, people, and so on. So she's also tried to, to develop a mnemonic device. We have the five R's. Again, this might be for that reason, something that's easy to use with students because we can help them to memorize these different ways of talking about significance. And you'll see that some of these are quite similar to what we've seen. So for example, I would say resonant in terms of people making analogies with it, connecting with experience across time and space is quite similar to what Partington calls relevant. So how does it help us understand the present, for instance, even though perhaps it's, it's certainly slightly different. But we can see certainly some different uh, elements appearing here that we haven't necessarily seen earlier. For example, we can see that she's added this idea of something being revealing. It, does this particular event or development reveal something meaningful about the past? And I think it's, it's interesting that we can try and find these perhaps more nuanced area by which we could measure significance. So building on the work of Phillips and Council, we then have this is the most recent one from Liz Sacadillo in 2006. And she's taken a, again a slightly different approach that suggests kind of a progression. So starting with contemporary significance, so at the time, and then you can see all the way down the bottom, this idea of present significance. So we bring it to today, what's the significance for us today? And again, we can see some similar aspects. So she's taken this idea of revealing that we saw in council's model earlier and included that as part of revelatory significance. But there are some things that are new here that we haven't seen in the other models. So causal significance, for example, I think is something that we probably all deal with quite often in our classrooms. How do we weigh up how significant different causes were in conflicts or other developments and events. And something else that I think is unusual is this idea of pattern significance. So within the broader scope of history and patterns and so on, is this something that is a turning point or is it is perhaps less significant because it's an example of continuity rather than change uh, and so on. 
So you can see each of these is using, in some senses, similar types of significance or criteria to measure significance by, but each is taking a slightly different approach. One last model that I'll show you, and we don't need to get into the details of this quite confusing diagram, but I think what is something that is interesting that Levesque has done here in his work studying, particularly in Canada, which is why we can see the Francophones and Anglophone approaches, is divided up these different types of significance into those that are disciplinary and so are perhaps more important to the history community. And you can see there that we have those are parting criteria that are appearing at the top there and those that are more related to memory. So this is where we have that symbolic significance or these sort of relevance. How do we draw lessons today based on the way that we remember these events from the past? So this might also be an interesting way to consider different, uh, different types of significance in terms of the discipline of history versus sort of memory and memorialization and so on. So those are a few different approaches that already exist in terms of the literature. But I do think that it can be valuable and important to have student generated criteria for measuring historical significance. And I am suggesting that there are two ways that you might be able to include this. So either I think what you could do is start a lesson with a discussion about significance and how do we decide what is significant. And so ask the students to themselves generate some of their own criteria. How would they measure significance? And then perhaps present either just one of these models, if there's one that you think is particularly relevant, or a couple of them and, and compare what the students came up with, with the models that were there. Another way that you could approach this is again, to choose one or more than one of these models and, and present that to the students. And I have, I've used Partington's in the past and look at those and then have the discussion with the students. What would you add? Is there some kind of significance or a measure of significance that's missing here? Or what would you change? Is there something that's in this model that you would refer to in a different way or you would modify in some sense? So I think it is important to use what's out there in theoretically as a basis, and that can be really helpful for students. And I find personally that it can be a useful anchor for them. But I do think it's important for students to also be thinking about these ideas themselves and how they might personally measure it. And this can lead to some really interesting and rich discussions. So why have I decided to spend <laughs> this time talking to you about all of these different approaches? I think there's a few reasons. The first is that it can really add complexity to student thinking about significance, because quite often students make claims about, well, this was the most important factor, or this was a, the most important event, or whatever it is. Uh, and when it comes to actually trying to justify that or weigh up the relative importance, there's not perhaps that much behind that thinking. And so giving them these kinds of criteria or types of significance can be helpful in terms of just adding a little bit of complexity in the way that they think about it. And then I think also it's useful to justify arguments. So if students are going to make claims about the significance of an individual or different events or factors in the past, they then have some language that they can use to justify those arguments well, this is significant because of the quantity of people that were impacted. And then they can develop that, of course, with evidence. So I think these approaches are useful for those reasons and can be really helpful in developing student thinking about historical significance. Okay, so tying that all back together, I've come up with just a few quite general example of different types of activities that you might be able to use or, of course, create variations of in your classroom that bring together the railways and connectivity source collection and some of these ideas and approaches to exploring historical significance. OK, so the first one I've tried to focus in particularly on railways and conflict. I've chosen the word conflict because some of them are wars, but some of them are not necessarily explicitly wars. There are other forms of conflict and so on. But I think the key question is, how significant have rail connections been to modern conflicts? And I think the question I've, I've termed it 
relatively vaguely for a reason, which is that I think rail connections, and as, I'll, as you'll see with some examples, might have been significant in causing modern conflicts in the nature and the sequence of modern conflicts and how those conflicts unfolded, and also perhaps as consequences of modern conflicts. And so I wanted to leave the question relatively broad in terms of significance to conflicts in general, so students could perhaps attack that question from different angles. So I've chosen six examples from the source collection that I thought would be relevant for answering this question, but there are absolutely more. And of course, it might depend on what you're studying at the time as to which of these might be the most appropriate to you. But I'd just like to briefly take you through each of these six case studies or examples, and then see how we might be able to use them to help for students to answer that overarching question. So the first source is referring to hospital trains, and the source does tell us about hospital trains in general. So we learn, for example, that the first hospital train was built during the Crimean War in the 1850s, and that they were used also in both world wars until we had aerial evacuation that became the preferred mode, of course, certainly in, in the later wars. But we can see in this particular source an image that is depicting the Boer War and a Red Cross hospital train that was used within the Boer War. And it, this particular train that we see at the top left there has just arrived in Durban and the soldiers are transporting patients off the train on stretchers and carrying them. So this might be a particular case of the use of trains that students could then research in greater depth. The middle source that we see here, the Berlin to Baghdad Railway, is particularly interesting in relation to the First World War. And you can see that the source is actually giving us a map of that rail route. And if we were looking at this on Historiana, there'd also be a scope for students to zoom in and really look at the different parts of that route and how it was developed. So initially, this railway was supported, but the British then decided that they were perhaps a little bit scared that the German port in the Persian Gulf would threaten their interests in India and that the tracks would run too close to the British oil fields in Persia. There was also fear from the Russian side that this would threaten Russia, who were the dominant power in that Persian Gulf region as well. So there is debate amongst historians about whether or not this railway and these concerns were a factor in the outbreak of the First World War, and that's perhaps an angle that students could look at. Something that is also interesting is it's linked to the outcomes of the First World War because the Treaty of Versailles stripped Germany of all of its rights to this particular railway. So it could also be interesting to look at the impact that that had and, and perhaps then also linking that to the causes of the Second World War. So this one in particular might be interesting if you are looking at that period of time. The third one on the right is the light railways. And again, this is relating to the First World War. So what we can see in that picture there, it's a light railway track. And these light railways were built all over and they did have to be rebuilt again and again because of the destruction that was caused. But they were really important in moving troops, moving supplies, ammunition, food rations, and so on, particularly across uneven terrain. And so this might be another case study of students that might be able to look into different light railways that were used throughout the war and how that played a role in, in the battles and so forth. If we move then down to the second row, I've included here the Trans-Siberian Railway as another example of a railway that's interconnected with conflict. So in particular, it's connected with the Second World War in the sense that it was very important for the transport of rubber between Germany and Japan, and that was made possible by the non-aggression pact between the USSR and Germany, and then of course the later agreements with Japan. So the fact that this railway spanned that whole continent and connected Asia with Europe was really important to the war effort and also to the relations between those countries. So this is another perhaps interesting example for students to investigate. The Thai Burma Railway, so this is the source that we saw earlier that was made by, I, I believe, a Dutch prisoner of war who was in the Dutch East Indies at the time. So this, the construction of this railway began in 1942 and it was completed ahead of schedule. There were around 250,000 Southeast Asian labourers that worked on it and another 
significant aspect and why you may already have heard of this particular railway is that around 60,000 Allied prisoners of war were also forced to construct this railway with basic tools and in really harsh conditions. And this is why we can see it being named the railway of death. So this might be another case study that students could explore in relation to the Second World War. And then the last image that you see here that I've selected is the partition in India and Pakistan. So that partition occurred in 1947 and the, tra the trains were really important for transporting refugees across the border in both directions. And it's felt that without having those railways, that the movement across the border would have been even more dangerous, of course, would have been more time consuming. And so it was really prioritized at the time, these rail services, so that the refugees could be transported as quickly as possible. What we see in this particular photo is a train transporting people from Punjab in India across the border into Pakistan. So these are just a few of the sources that appear, but you can see that each of them has quite a rich story and is related to conflict in, in various different ways. And I think this is why they might form interesting bases for a student exploration. So a suggested activity that you might want to use in relation to these sources would be first to ask students to conduct additional research, because I think the sources and the descriptions create a really great starting point and can, and can give students the direction they might want to conduct their research. But it is important, of course, that they really do understand the context of the different conflicts, more detail about the railway itself and how it was developed. So I really would encourage you to use these sources as a starting point and then allow students to go off and research a little bit more about these on their own. Then what I'd suggest is if you had, say, six groups, for example, and they each researched these different case studies, that they then share with one another, either by presenting in front of the class or with an expert jigsaw activity. So one member of each group becomes an expert in a new group and those six people share each about their, their findings. And then once all of the class is familiar with all six of those examples, then I think you can do some interesting things asking students to try and sort those railways according to their significance. And you could either do this, I can imagine, physically in the classroom, so perhaps you've printed out that source as an image and you're asking students to stand up in different orders in the classroom according to different types of significance. Maybe it's being you're sticking them on the wall or a board or maybe you're using an e-activity and I'll show you in a moment how I can envisage using the e-activity builder on Historiana to do this. So I would suggest that you agree with the students different criteria or types of significance you'd like them to focus on as they're making decisions about the relative significance of these different railways. So you might look at just one type of significance. So I've suggested here, for instance, contemporary significance. So this is coming from Circa Dio's approach. And this was the one that was about how important it was viewed as at the time by people that were living in that period. And so all I've done on the sorting tool here is I've got a line going from low significance to high significance. And students here could drag and drop each of those sources to represent how significant they seem to be at the time based on the research that they've conducted. What might be more interesting would be to try and have students evaluate significance on two different criteria at the same time. So that's what I've tried to do in this example. So we can see on the one side, we have significance in terms of quantity. So how many people's lives were impacted by this railway. I'm referring back to Partington here. And then across the bottom, we can see we've got significance in terms of profundity. So how deeply were people's lives affected? And again, students might drag and drop if they felt that this particular railway impacted a lot of people, but not very profoundly, or impacted a lot of people and very profoundly and so on. And so we can see that on these two axes, students are now having to make perhaps more complicated decisions. I think along with this, you can have some really interesting discussions about, well, is one of these more important than the other? Is a profound impact more significant than one that impacts a lot of people? Are they equally important? Do measuring these sort of two types of significance help us to make decisions about the relative importance of these different railways or not? 
I think there are some really interesting discussions to be had once we start looking at multiple different types of significance that the students can engage with. Okay, so another example is focusing more on technology rather than conflict, for example. So we could look at how significant the impacts were of the advances in rail technology over time. And I think here, this is where comparing and contrasting rather than sorting perhaps becomes a more useful method or type of activity. One quite simple, quick activity, and it might be a good kind of starter type activity, would be to compare and contrast the Mumbles Railway, which was built in Wales in 1804, and the Liverpool to Manchester Railway, which is built in England in 1830. So we can see it's not a huge amount of time in between these two, but we will see, of course, that there's quite a significant difference in terms of the technology, particularly because the Liverpool to Manchester Railway was the first one to exclusively use steam to be fully timetabled, signalling systems, carrying mail and so on. So it's a really well-developed rail linkage, and it was the first of its kind. So I think you could ask students to do one or two of the following, either quite simply ask them just to look at the features of rail travel that they can see in the sources in the images and make comparisons just on those features themselves, or add in this idea about significance and ask them to consider, well, what might be significant about the technological advances that we can see as we compare and contrast these two. So for example, you can see the two images here. So on the left, this is the mumbles that we saw earlier. And on the right, we can see an artistic representation of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway. So when you're using the compare tool, students just choose a color and they draw a square around a particular feature in each image. And then you can ask them to write a little annotation about something they notice that's different. So the really obvious difference here is the one that I've chosen for the example, which is we can see the Mumbles Railway is horse drawn and the Liverpool and Manchester Railway is steam powered. And that's a very obvious technological difference. The images are quite small in this screenshot I've taken, but students are able to zoom in on the images when they're actually in the e-activity. So they can look much more closely and try and investigate things that seem to be different in the two. If you did want to ask them to look at significance and, uh, and try and use some of that terminology to justify it, this is an example of, of an, a response I can imagine a student giving. So for instance, in the Mumbles Railway, it's horse-drawn, so we've only got the possibility to have one carriage, whereas we can see that there are multiple carriages, five of them, I think, that are represented in the image of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway. So a student could argue, well, this is a significant development, a significant change in terms of quantity, because it now means quite simply that more people are able to travel by rail because the trains are longer and have a bigger capacity to transport. And therefore, this is affecting more and more people's lives. So this is, I think, an example of how you might use compare and contrast, and you wouldn't be limited to only two sources. In this tool, you can add multiple sources. So if you wanted them to compare three or four or five different images of railways from different times, that might also be an interesting thing to do to add a little bit more complexity or a, a greater a period of time, because obviously we're just looking here at the early 1800s. If you wanted then to also look in a little bit more detail at the source, you can see here we've got the description of the source on the right that gives us a little bit more depth and information about the railway itself. And I will, forgive me, I'm just going to very quickly read it just so we're all on the same page. So the image shows the passenger service of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway in England, which was completed in 1830. It was the first railway to exclusively use steam locomotives, be fully timetabled, use signalling systems and carry mail, Faster travel and communication boosted trade and industry. Due to its speed, the train became known as the rocket. This railway was the trigger for the proliferation of railways throughout Britain. Railways became integral to the economy as they transported essential commodities such as coal and iron and people for the manufacturing industries. So even just using that description alone without conducting any further research, you could ask students what types of significance can we already infer from the description of this source? So for instance, I would say 
we could say that this was significant in the sense that it was remarkable because the train got the nickname the rocket because it was so quick. We could say it was significant in the sense of sort of pattern significance because it's a turning point. Here we see this is a trigger for the proliferation of railways throughout Britain. We could also, perhaps if we wanted to take Phillips approach and have different types or categories of significance, obviously it's got very, very strong economic significance because of its role in transporting both commodities and people for these industries and so on. So even just from the small description, we can start to draw out different kinds of significance or different criteria by which we could measure the significance of just this particular railway. And then again, if you did want to take it further, we, we could encourage the students to do some more specific research. So can they find additional ways in, in addition to what's already included here that it was significant? Are there ways that it wasn't significant? I think what's always interesting is perhaps there were certain parts of society or, or socioeconomic groups that were very much affected by the railways, but perhaps there were others that were not, and why? And then our students, after having done kind of a more comprehensive investigation, well, how would they assess the overall significance of, of the impacts of this evolving technology, particularly if we compare it to earlier forms of rail travel, like the Mumbles train? How significant was this evolution? So that's another way that you might approach it. And my third and final one, uh, and then I will stop talking because I know I've done a lot of talking at you and hopefully we can have a bit of a, a discussion as well, is to think about perspectives. So how significant were the development of rail connections for different groups? Because the significance, of course, may vary depending on who we're speaking about. And also if, that's, if the significance was perhaps positive or negative might also differ. So some guiding questions that you could propose to the students for a discussion, for which groups was it most significant and why and what type of significant did it, ha did it have for them? And for which groups was it least significant and why and what type of significance did it have for them? And you might find that the type of significance differs quite dramatically between the different groups you look at, for instance. So here for this one, I've chosen another source that we haven't seen yet. It's the first transcontinental railway. So it is linking the Atlantic and Pacific oceans and it's developed, it's opened in 1855. So we're talking about 50 years before the Panama Canal. And therefore it's very important in that particular period, but we could raise questions about how important it was once the Panama Canal was completed and opened. And I think what's interesting here is that we can see the railway was financed by private US companies built using labor from the US, China, Indian, Caribbean, Ireland, Australia, and slaves. We can also see the impact that it had on those workers. So many of them died from disease and the working conditions in which they were operating and also the fact that it did create this really fast connection and had a really important economic impact in terms of the gold rush. So here, for example, we could already identify some different groups uh, that might have different ideas or, or it might have been impacted differently by this particular railway. So we have already mentioned in here the US companies, so we could look at how significant this was for them. We have mentioned the different labourer groups, including slaves. So we could look at the different impacts that it had for those either immigrant labour groups or the enslaved peoples. And particularly, we can already see, we've given clues in the description already about the really negative and significant impacts that it had on those groups. And we could also, as I mentioned down the bottom here, look at different types of significance. So it had economic significance in terms of the gold rush, but also social significance in terms of what it meant for the laborers that were there to develop it. So we could look at all of those different types of perspectives and consider how significance varies between different groups. So those are three possible ways that I think you might be able to use this collection and the idea of historical significance. And that is kind of all I really wanted to cover. So I might throw it open now to the group and even stop sharing to see if there are any questions or comments or ideas anyone would like to share. Have you already taught about railways or significance in your classroom? This might just be a good time to share experiences or questions.
I know that it always takes a couple of minutes to, you know, collect your thoughts. So I would like to use this couple of minutes to already thank you, Bridget, for your presentation. This is one of my favorite source collections, and I think it was very, very nice to see how you would use it. This is my favorite source collection because I had a teacher when I was at high school who, both at middle school and high school, who made us imagine a trip around the world using whatever was the tr transport mean of choice of the teacher or depending on the period that we were looking at. So I organized, yeah, my trip around the world in the 1600s and then in the 1700s and then in the 1800s. And I think that the source collection would have made it much, much easier to actually see what I was dealing with. I see in the chat that Christina was saying that the presentation helped us learn a lot about the types of questions that we can make in the classroom. Christina says that usually they watch videos and read texts about the transport revolution, but sometimes they might be a little bit difficult to understand. I have been pulling up the website and looking at the different source collections as you've been explaining them. And one of the things that I find, especially with teachers as we're trying to, to utilize these resources, is being able to talk to somebody who knows more information about them. And you just very effortlessly gave some context that maybe wasn't on that site. How do we learn more about these specifically? Because my teachers and myself, this is an area that we, I mean, we focus on transcontinental railroad in say the United States. It's a, it's a no brainer, but looking at Panama is very intriguing and we don't really spend a lot of time on that. So where might I go to learn more about this specific map? Do you have like, is there a way to email to ask questions or how would we do that? Oh, that's a great question. Alicia, do you have the answer? I don't know that I have the answer to that. I mean, presumably our historical content team would be very willing to, to look into questions. that. Yeah. yeah. I think as a follow-up, I can ask the historical content team. We have now a member of the historical content team that is actually based in the state and might have access to the sources that might be useful for, yeah, for, for you. That's a great idea. We don't currently have a way to do that, but perhaps that's something that we need to add because I know the team does a huge amount of research as they put it together. And so yeah. I'm sure they have some materials they could point you to. Excellent. Thank you so much. This has been very informative. And so I really appreciate the time and effort put into this. It's incredible. If you have any other questions or comments, just right. feel free to drop me an email. I will be happy to put you in contact with the right person for the answer.